So welcome to this uh, lecture about uh, the Breitenberg vehicles, embodied nervous systems. Um, so I use this lecture to uh, position a little bit what we'll be doing uh, during most of the course, we'll, do, we'll be doing neurodynamics. And this is about maybe making concrete how dynamical systems play a role in generating behavior and thought ultimately, and to make this distinction between uh, dynamics in a behavioral control theoretical sense, I'll make sense of that now, and a neural sense. It's also a very nice conceptual story. I, I uh, really love the underlying book, Valentino Breitenberg. Uh, he was a South Tyrolean who uh, taught in Germany. He was in the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, died a few years ago. Uh, he wrote uh, a little booklet that's called Breitenberg, uh, it's called Vehicles. He's the author, Valentino Breitenberg. Highly recommend that booklet. It's a really a fun booklet. Still being, still in press, MIT Press originally, and there's a German edition. Um, he used uh, the, this notion of a vehicle. Here it is. This notion of a vehicle as a metaphor uh, actually to discuss um, neuroanatomy. He was an, a neuroanatomist, a quantitative neuroanatomist, one of those uh, people who count synapses in slices that they produce from you know, tissue. Um, who He made a mouse, an atlas of the mouse with his uh, long-term collaborator Schutz. I forgot her the first name, Anja Schutz, perhaps Schutz, uh, have a, uh, a, a book about the mouse brain. Um, very interesting insights from that work. For instance, he's one of those who, the, the two of them uh, argued uh, that almost all synapses are part of recurrent loops rather than part of forward loops. It's, you too. it's not trivial how to make a statement like that, but for some reasonable concepts from topology, they, they made statements like that. And, and that, very interesting for theory. You'll see that over the course. Um, so he taught in summer schools. I think this was one of the regular summer schools that uh, happened in Corsica for a long time. Um, principles of neuroanatomy, and he used this notion of vehicles to illustrate functional implications of the architecture of the brain. And, and of course, that's not an entire course, and I'm, I'm just giving you a highlight. In fact, I'm only talking about one vehicle out of about 40 something vehicles that he has in this book. And so each vehicle illustrates a particular brain circuit that he hypothesized and, and what you can do with it. Um, and I, I sort of twist that a little bit and take that as a illustration of how we can understand how behavior and ultimately also thought can arise from a nervous system that is connected to the world through sensors and motor systems. And, and that's what the vehicles are about. And I'll explain that now in somewhat uh, in detail. So Breitenberg actually, um, went ahead and came up with more abstract kinds of behaviors, for instance, counting, um, that are purely mental, that, that uh, where the, the fact that the vehicle can move around doesn't actually matter. And that's what we'll be getting at when we talk about neurodynamics later, but then we'll actually no longer use his vehicle metaphor. It also turns out that that metaphor kind of breaks down. It's actually only the simplest vehicles that really work. And we actually, in our robotic class, uh, lab course, um, have a element where you use a Breitenberg vehicle and, and can actually realize a robot vehicle on a table uh, that does meaningful things by following these Breitenberg rules. So let me get to this conceptual point that he makes. So, so why, why vehicle? You know, you think of a vehicle more, more as a car or you know, something like that. So, so his notion of vehicle um, was meant to emphasize that. Uh, in a lot of cases, when an organism behaves, that ultimately means it moves, uh, that the sensors that this organism has are also moved. So when you are a vehicle, for instance, here this square is supposed to be a vehicle, and you have some sensors, your eyes, and you move around by these motors, then the eyes move because they are attached to the body. And that creates the sort of closed loop situation from which uh, interesting uh, results emerge, and I'll be talking about that today. Um, where, as compared to, let's say, if you if you have an arm, 
and uh, the sensor is your eye and you just move the, the arm around, then you see the movement of the arm, but uh, the movement of the arm does not itself, you know, does not move the sensor. So it does um, sensory consequences rely on you making sense of the movement of the arm that you make, which is much more advanced kind of computation, much more complex kind of computation. So in the summer semester, when I teach about robotics, actually I use that to explain how it's easier to make mobile robots behave autonomously than to autonomously reach or grasp, for instance, which is actually a fact in state of the art. That has to do with that uh, subtlety here. <clears throat> so uh, Breitenberg's uh, notion of, of using vehicle uh, comes from the cybernetics tradition. He was uh, one of the founding directors of the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen of, for biological cybernetics, as it was called at the time. Um, and that's all about behavior emerging from organisms that are in the environment and where the loop is closed in the sense that the actions of the agent of the animal uh, steer or control its perceptions, its sensation. And the sensation you know, influences the actions of the closed loop. Um, so, th so this is the, the vehicle in the natural. And I'll take that apart. And, and the five important components in here are the environment, where there is some structure in the environment that's much overlooked often, sensors, motors, a body, a body, the body essentially connects the sensors and the motors physically, mechanically, and a nervous system, these lines here, the nervous system connects the sensors to the motors um, in neural. Here again, a, a more systematic sketch of that. So you have these four elements that are a abstraction and a simplification of what an organism is, an organism as an embodied nervous system that has Effectors, sensors, a nervous system, and a body. Well, this nervous system again couples them at a neural level. The body couples them at a mechanical level, and then the whole thing is emerged in an environment. And only if it is emerged in the environment to which it is adapted, which biologically would be what we expect, does perhaps meaningful uh, behavior emerge. I'll give you some examples of of that now. So let's first talk about what we mean by sensors and motors or effectors. <clears throat> so sensors are um, essentially transducers of something physical into something neural. You're all familiar with photoreception in the retina, with maybe you're uh, familiar with the hair cells in the, in the ear, in the cochlea, for instance, that translate uh, sound waves. Sound is actually trans uh, transformed into um, pressure waves in a, a fluid and that fluid moves hair around and this bending of the hairs from stage is sensed by uh, cells, hair cells that then fire in response to how much these hairs uh, bend. Uh, and you have that kind of uh, principle sort of hair cell in the skin all over, you know, so touch is very much um, about that little de deformations of the skin are sensed by cells that then fire in response. You have um, mechanical senses like that in, in the muscles. So body sense, proprioception, knowing where, how your joints are oriented and uh, how long your muscles are and how, how quickly they uh, contract, for instance, are sensed by similar organs that, that translate me mechanical transduction into neural activity. Um, and then you have these odd, old, evolutionary old sensors that uh, react to chemicals, like in smell and, and taste, for instance. And so what characterizes all of those is that they have some systematic relationship between what this neuron, these cell cell, you know, sensor cells and neurons, um, what they generate as electrical state, you know, these neurons, for instance, might fire or have an intracellular membrane potential that changes uh, as a function of the physical thing that happens. So some physical intensity, you know, light, intensity, luminance would be the case, or sound pressure, or um, you know, the, the amount of force to exert on the skin, and so on. Mm -hmm. So when you have a, uh, a functional relationship like that, I'm, I'm hinting here that it could be a monotonic relationship. Um, it doesn't have to be linear, but if it's monotonic, then you would call that a code. A code is 
a transformation between two spaces that is invertible. And if it's uh, monotonic, it's invertible. Invertible just really means that you know, if you have a certain intensity, you will find a certain activity in that neuron or activation level in that neuron um, in return. And conversely, if you know how much that neuron is firing, so you have its activation level, then you can trace back what the intensity out there is, right? It's invertible because it is monotonic. You know, if it was not monotonic, there could be, for instance, two values that give rise to the same level of activation. So that is very often, in fact, I believe it's everywhere the case in the uh, sensory periphery that um, the, 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 the cells that are very close to the actual sensor cells have these monotonic characteristics. And that would mean that you could think of the activation as somehow encoding the physical state. And this is just a way of talking about it, you know, to call it encoding. It is really just this uh, mapping that characterizes this. I'll make that problematic a little later, but that's the first approximation. So sometimes people call this a rate code. It's mostly theoreticians who use that term because activation in this, um, in most nervous systems are, um, uh, is represented by uh, spiking neurons. And this is the rate at which they, uh, activation is then assessed by the rate at which they fire and uh, or produce these spikes. And then you would say that's a code that translates physical intensity into a rate. Not entirely true. There are actually some very special fast cells in even in humans that have these so-called gap junction synapses that don't require spiking so that the membrane potential is directly translated into postsynaptic potential. So then, then it's not really rate. It's it will be one synapse later. It's a rate now. So that's the abstraction of that. So that's what sensors are <clears throat> now. Effectors or motors, uh, you know, are are uh, sort of the reverse. Uh, Bradberg always drew these motors as these little squares like tires, like what would be a tire seen from the top, like a Formula One car tire, a broad tire. <laughs> so it eliminates all kind of mechanical problems of how this would be actually stable. So uh, think of it as, as you're seeing a, a wheel from the top, it will be rotating you know, in depth. Um, and so how much it is rotating, rotations per minute will be going to be the motor action of those things. That's the image we'll be using. Um, of course, animals don't have wheels, right? This is clearly a metaphor. Uh, and there's something to be said about that. I'll come back to that later in the lecture. Um, so there are reflex loops in the periphery, for instance, and muscles have certain properties that are different from those of wheels. Uh, but in, in, in an abstraction of idealization or metaphorical idealization, we think of motors as transducers which take as an input some kind of activation and then generate something physical, right? They reverse the encoding. You could say it's like a decoding where you say at that level of activation, my movement should be this much. So ideally, if, if it's just a, a wheel actuated, then it would rotate with a speed perhaps that is um, affected or is controlled by how much activation goes into that neuron. And um, you already know that uh, or maybe intuit that it's not really going to be as simple as that if you ever played with a toy car for instance maybe an electrical car or you know, you know what experience you have um, or even you know if you drive a car you know that uh, if you think of the gas pedal being the analogous to activation then you know that by just pressing the gas pedal, that doesn't yet fix the speed or the acceleration of the vehicle. It will depend on if you're going uphill or downhill, or if there's a lot of wind or not, or a lot of friction or not. And in, in, a, in a toy car, you might uh, see this very dramatically if you use a little toy car on carpet versus on a hard floor, you'll see a real difference in the mechanical effect. So, um, the actual mechanical effect depends on physical coupling to the world, which is actually also some form of dynamics. You were reminded last week that dynamic systems are really the language in which we can capture the interaction of physical systems. Um, and that has implications. Um, so that means that it's a physical contribution to behavioral generation in a sense. It turns out that that is also true for sensors. So engineers among you will immediately recognize that, that 
uh, for instance, a lot of sensors have some kind of frequency, uh, frequency profile that is they will be uh, responding well when the time variation of the signal has a particular frequency so lies in a certain uh, range of, of, of time variation um, and and not when it's too fast or not when it, or, or not well defined when it's too slow um, and and that comes from the fact that the sensor is exact, itself also a physical system and that transduces you know whatever stimulation is out there into some physical action and that transduction um, also has dynamical properties um, so when you couple the whole thing in the environment then th that actually will play a role but for now i just want to make you aware of that it's always an abstraction when we talk about coding because in reality everywhere there is dynamic system hidden in there Okay, so that's um, sensors and effectors. So what does the body do? Uh, the body makes that the uh, sensors move with the motor. So in a vehicle, very simple case, always think of the square as being like the trunk or the body of, of the vehicle. And we're sort of neglecting that the two wheels are at the back. If you actually have robots, typically two active wheels are in the middle of the robot, and maybe there's some passive wheels in the front and the back so it doesn't fall over. The little robots in our robot class, for instance, are circular, and there's a passive, it's actually just a little plastic knob that drags along the ground so it doesn't fall over. There are also interesting mechanical problems at that level. Uh, can the vehicle turn on the spot? Robots can do that. Cars actually can't. And the steering of cars is uh, more complicated. Parking a car isn't actually so trivial, as you may know. Uh, so all of that, of course, we're not interested in here. And in, in, in actual animals, there is a lot that happens at the mechanical level. So for instance, when you're running then you will be uh, periodically uh, transmitting energy into you know, from from your muscles into for instance tendons or even into the ground if you're running on elastic ground you will be running more energy efficiently because some of the energy that you exert in uh, pushing against the ground is returned to you on the uh, when you uh, on the rebound um, and there are biomechanists who study things like that in sports physicists who are interested in that sort of thing. So there is interesting dynamics that's hidden in the body, but we'll neglect that for now. And the nervous system, well, that's here a very trivial nervous system. So the nervous system would say, in this conception is something that trades in activation. So what, again, what activation is concretely when you look into more detail of um, neuroanatomy. I might do a little tutorial on neurophysics if, if any of you is interested. Uh, you know, there, there are different levels of description for that. There are these spiking events that are, you know, the majority, I mean, huge majority of um, synapses in, uh, in the human nervous system clearly are uh, chemical in nature. So they are driven by spikes, by these action potentials with a few gap junctions there in special cases. Uh, there are some invertebrates where these gap junctions are more common. Um, and, and therefore you can think of activation as being either the spikes, so then you think of rate, or uh, you could think of those things that cause the spikes would be the interest and potentials. Uh, and so that you know, can think of you know, as a huge dimensional space of all these different activation variables, all the neurons are 10 to the power 11, 12 uh, neurons that uh, humans have and other animals come close to that, they would be and making the state space in which these activation states live. And so the nervous system is trading these things, so, so transmitting and coupling these things. So this is a very simple one where there's only generation of activation at the sensor, absorption of activation at the motor, and this is just a con a straight um, transmission. So activation from this cell goes to that cell and activation from this cell goes to that cell. So this would be called an ipsilateral nervous system and Breitenberg presented this to, um, to, to show what laterality can do. You could think of a contralateral system, it's in his book where you take the activation from this sensor and put it into this motor and vice versa. As you may know, in the human nervous system, we actually have a contralateral organization, uh, both from the sensors to the brain and then from the brain to the, the body. And then you think about the, con the, the uh, 
um, the functional consequence of that. That was by Beitenberg's point. My, my point is less specific than that. So the nervous system uh, can engage as soon as you have transduced something from the world into these inner variables, the activation variables, and then again, uh, have tr you transform somewhere these activation variables to the motor system. So you might think of this as an input-output system. The input is sensor information, the output is the action, but it happens in closed loop. And that's the other important thing. It happens in an environment where the motor system affects what sensor information you get. And so the environment has to be structured right. So, so for instance, this is a drawing I made by hand. Uh, frankly, I'm not sure it's very illustrative. Um, just thinking of um, some sensor that is sensitive to some intensity, and then you would have variation in that environment. Um, and that would mean there's a distribution of intensities. Um, and that has to be right in some way um, to be meaningful to your agent to your organism or vehicle. So we'll see in a moment that uh, the simplest vehicles are sensitive to local differences in intensity, local gradients. And you could imagine if these uh, gradients are such that on the size of the vehicle, you know, this, the external world already changes intensity many times, so it's very um, random, then the vehicle will not pick up something systematic, will just pick up noise, look, nothing interesting arises. Uh, on the other hand, if, if the intensity was so constant that the vehicle couldn't actually pick up any differences, again, it would be mostly noise, but what it picks up, then it also wouldn't behave right. So the so uh, a particular vehicle uh, with a particular, for instance, distance between these two sensors, and that distance might be critical for it picking up gradients, uh, would work well in environments where the intensity is structured on that scale. And in biology, you will always find that animals are adapted to their environment. So if in the environment there, is, there are certain source of sensor information that have certain structure, then the sensor systems have evolved to be sensitive to that structure and maybe not sensitive to other structures. So it's not by, by chance that we, uh, you know, the, the kind of flight frequencies, for instance, we're sensitive to are those that are informative about stuff in the environment. Uh, so for instance, for, for a lot of surfaces that are around for us, uh, optic, the optic part of spectrum is very important. And you might know that some animals, like some insects are sensitive to other frequencies outside our visible spectrum. And that's adaptive in that uh, in these frequencies, some of the flowers that they um, use as sources of food, you know, where, where they get the, the pollen, um, can be distinguished in, for instance, the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And so they developed uh, a sensor that picks that up. We don't because we don't really harvest pollen very much. And, and so we have uh, our adaptive sensors that are more adapted to hunting in general and be, be, being very flexible. Uh, so this slide, I'll unpack this slide. And, and so yesterday, I, I think the, the few of you who are in this cognitive science exercise uh, spend a lot of time thinking through this. Um, so what I want to do now is I, I, I want to make uh, plausible how some behavior emerges from a system like that when it's embedded in the right environment, make this more concrete. And then we'll actually um, treat this a bit more formally mathematically and show that it's a dynamical system, what happens here. So let's first do this sort of mental simulation. This is the vehicle that Brattenberg called the Texas orientation vehicle. This is the only one of his elementary. He has four elementary vehicles. And uh, this is the only one that's actually biologically realistic. He, call, he calls one of them love and the other fear. And I know, so some very ma metaphorical. And I think Texas is maybe what he calls love. I'm, I'm, I don't remember exactly. Um, so the four vehicles are organized by the spatial structure of the nervous system. So you have ipsilateral, which would be this one, or contralateral, where would the connection goes across. So this is the ipsilateral. And when the, in each of those, you can either have monotonically increasing or, mono, uh, sorry, increasing or monotonically decreasing um, characteristic, sensor characteristics. So the Texas vehicle comes about when you have um, uh, one decreasing and the other increasing. It doesn't matter, you can flip that, which one is the positive and which is the negative, you know, that 
doesn't change anything about the function. Um, and then you get the other vehicle if both of them are increasing. And it doesn't, again, you can flip that, that doesn't matter. And then so, so you have the two ways of combining these and you have uh, it's and contralateral, and those are the four <laughs> elementary vehicles. And those are the ones that work. And everyone, all the other vehicles don't work unless you do something special. I mean, they, they were just Gedanken experiments and just, just sort of mental simulations. So let's go through this one and see how, how it works or why, what it does intuitively. So, um, so let's think, first assume that something about the environment. So let's assume that uh, the amount, the, somehow uh, the intensity comes from a source, could be a sound source, you know, uh, in Breitenberg's language, it's a source of heat and there would be a temperature sensor. Actually, we don't have that as humans. Um, sound source may be good. So, so one of those sensors is closer to the sound source than the other by this, by, by virtue of uh, uh, the, you know, the size of the vehicle and this orientation to the sound source. You could have other reasons. You could have that these sensors are directionally sensitive. So it would be a matter of the angle to the sound source. And there would be a slightly different angle between the left and the right. And you know, it depends on the physical nature of, of the interaction. Could be different ways this comes about. But the, the main point is that these two sensors will pick up a difference in intensity, and therefore they will transmit to their motors a difference in activation. Um, so specifically, let's say this sensor here uh, picks up a higher intensity than the sensor here on the right because it's closer and because we're assuming that the uh, intensity falls off with the distance from the source. Uh, so if the left sensor picks up a high intensity and has this negative characteristic, then it will uh, return less activation, so fire less strongly as it is simulated more, less strongly than the right one. So when it's less strongly activated, it drives the corresponding wheel less because a more positive monotonic function than the right one, which fires more. Uh, so this motor turns less than that motor. And if you try to visualize that mechanically, that would mean the vehicle turns in the way indicated here by this arrow. It will be turning here to the left, this you know, rotating less than that. If this was rotating in, in the negative direction exactly as much as this one turns in a positive direction, then it would be turning on the spot, the vehicle. This way it will be still be moving forward, but less on this side and then on that side that would amount to it turning. So in this case, actually, if I would reduce the difference between the um, intensities felt by these two sensors. So once the vehicle is really uh, facing the source symmetrically so that one sensor is at the same distance as the other, just symmetrically around the direct axis to the source, then both of those would get the same intensity, return the same activation, both wheels turn in the same way the vehicle would be running straight into the source. And that's why it's taxis means orientation to the source. You could even have that the uh, vehicle might ultimately stop if there is a intensity where this really goes to zero. The plot is here ambiguous. Uh, let's say you're moving to the source and it becomes hotter and hotter or brighter and brighter. And at some point you hit where this activation is zero. And if the uh, characteristic here for the wheel really goes through zero, then if you, if you return zero activation, put that into the wheel, the vehicle would come to stop. So it would really be orienting and then stopping in some kind of oriented way to the source. This is actually a very common behavior in animals and also actually in some plants. It can be brought about in ways that doesn't require a nervous system. For instance, some of you will know that you know, these um, sunflowers, are they called sunflowers? Um, I think so, right? These certain kind of flowers that seem to follow the sun and they have some simple mechanism that's not based on nervous system, it's just physical mechanism that makes that they are oriented to the source of uh, radiation. And there are a couple of other uh, in instances of that, but there are also, um, and you know, for instance, there are some uh, sing single cell organisms that have orientation behavior, again, based on something physical. Uh, but it's also very common behavior in very simple insects and other invertebrates, and uh, you have it in um, animals as well. You have uh, orientation reflexes of this nature in, 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 uh, in human infants. A bit more complex in this section. 
So this is sort of the, the, the idea how behavior could emerge if everything is right. That is, if the environment has the right structure and it's uh, sufficiently simple for this kind of mental simulation to work. And uh, you know, all of those things need to be tuned right for this to work. Now, the exercise that I will be asking you to do and that some of you did in sort of informal form yesterday in the session with Daniel Sabinas, uh, we'll ask you to do a written form of that, and this is a bit more advanced than what you did yesterday uh, for this course. That will uh, invite you to think deeper about that, is to uncover all the assumptions in here, and uh, you will actually see that it breaks down, that it doesn't actually always behave like that. Actually, it turns out that if you characterize uh, these kinds of vehicles mathematically, there are uh, people who model these things mathematically, then there can be these turn out to be dynamic systems. Some of those are dynamic systems that actually show this uh, famous behavior that's called chaotic deterministic dynamics. So even without noise, they would have very irregular looking behavior because it's a, uh, the overall effect, if you model it some way, would be a negative, uh, a nonlinear dynamic system. And those can have very uh, complex solutions where a very small difference in initial condition takes you to different futures, different future behaviors. A former postdoc here at uh, our institute, actually someone called Iñaki Rano, published uh, about that and analyzed the stability of very complex kind of behaviors and so on. So um, we're not going to go into that. Um, so the message of this kind of exercise among others, one message is that you have to be a little bit more precise to really understand the emergence when you see it doesn't always happen. So it depends on the quantitative details uh, if it happens. And in the uh, introduction to current science course, this was meant to il illustrate the need for mathematical models for making it concrete. That's also a message I wanna promote here. And that means that some of the assumptions that we made have to be formalized. And so what's the bottleneck for that? Interesting, right? Um, many of you might think, or a lot of our neuroscience colleagues think, the problem is to model this, you know, the, to get, so neuroscientists will very typically think, well, you know, I, of course, it's very simple uh, animal, but if you had a real animal, it would be more complex, and it's the difficulty of figuring out the nervous system, how everything is wired up. Usually, they don't think it's so complicated to understand the sensor and motor systems, which are actually in practice also quite complex, especially the motor systems are much more than just these little transduction devices. Muscles have a lot of interesting dynamic properties. But most of the effort would usually be go into uh, making a model of the nervous system. But to actually make sense of uh, the emergence in this case, you, what, what is really the bottleneck is uh, a model of the environment. And when you have different environments, different pro properties, there will be different constraints on, on the conditions under which this behavior emerges. So here, essentially, what you need is some understanding of how intensity is distributed spatially to then see what would emerge. So implicitly, we've been assuming something about the intensity environment that, uh, that it would be characterized by sources, you know, that the Texas is all about Texas behavior, about orienting to certain places, which are sources. So there's a you know, concept here that the space, spatial distribution of intensity can be characterized by something like sources, something like an object concept. Um, and so the, if the intensity falls off with the distance, very typically would assume it falls off in some nonlinear way, maybe in an exponential way. And, and that would then be either uh, this, the, the reason why there is a dependence on orientation relative to the source, or there could be additional mechanisms that characterize the sensor. So there will be a, a sensor model, not in terms of input output, but of its physical properties of how the physical mechanism of, of, of its sensing, whatever drives the sensing, depends on the orientation to the source. So I'm not disambiguating that here, and we will not actually be needing, we will just, we'll just assume that we, we are in this picture here. Uh, well, this could cause that picture because the two, the two sensors uh, are at slightly different distance. <clears throat> uh, 
so that will be the dependence on the orientation to a source of the sensor with the assumption that if you're facing the source, you have the highest intensity. This is, for instance, true about microphones. I, uh, oh, this was last in summer semester. Yeah. Some of you who were maybe in my summer semester lecture saw that we built a, a phonotaxis robot that was using a sensor characteristic like that uh, uh, based on microphones that are sensitive to the direction from which the sound comes. And so to make the analysis mathematical and formal and therefore quantitative and find out the limits, limits of this mental simulation uh, account, you need to make specific mathematical assumptions like that. Here, of course, still very simple. Now imagine to scale that to more interesting uh, you know, organisms that do more interesting things like vision. <clears throat> Uh, you know, there is a so-called Blue Brain project in uh, Lausanne, which is part of the European uh, huge human brain project, in which um, researchers are trying to combine a lot of detailed data about the circuits in the in the visual cortex. And in fact, they, they take a column in primary visual cortex with all its layers and all these different kinds of neurons and combine a lot of data that we have from intercellular recordings and slices of this tissue to make a mathematical model of that column. That will be the extreme case. And, and the original idea was then that will be a model of vision, but they don't have any model of the environment or what kind of visual tasks you have. You know, are you looking at object, ob objects, um, classification, discrimination, estimation, detection from foreground segmentation mm -hmm. under which conditions uh, based on lighting, on color, on, on shading. So <laughs> you see this uh, is uh, this underestimation of um, the extent to which nervous neural network or, or neural nervous systems are specifically adapted to a particular ecology, we call it, a particular structure of the environment and maybe also of the, the task of possible movements. Okay, so um, when we formalize that, we can actually, uh, theta, okay, uh, sorry, good question. So theta is meant to be the angle between uh, some, you know, the vehicle or maybe the, you know, the, the sensor has some, some coordinate system, the angle between the sensor and the source. Sorry, should I really put that into that slide? So in this case, it will be this axis and then this axis that goes like this to the sensor. <clears throat> and so I'll, I'll prove by graphical uh, illustration to you that the mental simulation really works uh, by going mentally through a couple of con concatenations. I believe that Dani Sabinas did that a little bit yesterday. I'm not sure he showed the exact same slides, but he had that kind of argument in his solving the exercise that you did. Um, but for everyone else, it's going to be new. Uh, and that's possible because I have this formalization now of what the sensor characteristic is. So it's a model of the sensor and the, and the environment. Uh, so the, the theorem I'm going to prove is that the Texas behavior emerges because there is an attractor in the space of heading. Heading is this orientation of the vehicle relative to some arbitrary axis, so I'm assuming a horizontal axis, and that the angle between that arbitrary axis and the forward axis of the vehicle would be heading. So if the vehicle is moving forward, it would be its velocity vector as it is moving forward um, compared to some fixed world axis. If it has a compass, it will be, let's say, relative to the north. This will not be important how that axis is calibrated and so on, it doesn't really matter. And so we'll, we'll prove that there is a dynamical system that uh, models or explains the motor behavior of this vehicle. Dynamical system means, as you learned from Sophie last week, uh, that there is a variable, a state variable, heading direction, and it's derivative, the derivative of heading direction, uh, the uh, in time, the rate of change of heading direction is called the turning rate, rotationsgeschwindigkeit, uh, the turning rate of the vehicle is the derivative of its current heading. Uh, it doesn't matter from which axis you, you compute because when you take the derivative, then uh, you know, it would be the same for different uh, coordinate systems. <clears throat> And uh, we'll say an, it emerges from an attractor. Remember, you learned that last week, that an attractor is a zero crossing of the turning rate, the so-called fixed points. 
that induces a constant solution. That is, if you have that heading direction, you don't change your heading any further. You will keep going in that direction. And it has this negative uh, slope as it goes through that zero crossing, meaning that if you have a heading that's larger, then you will have a decrease, negative rate of change, or so decrease of heading toward that fixed point. If you're on the left, you have a larger uh, a positive turning rate, you will increase and converge to the setting. So the definition of stability, as you learned last time, is that you converge to the fixed point, stability of a fixed point, you converge to a fixed point from neighboring solutions. And, and that will be guaranteed if this form of dependence of the turning rate on the heading were to emerge. So I want to make plausible to you uh, by graphical uh, proof not with detailed formulas um, that that is actually what happens in this vehicle. And here's the outline of how we will do that. And so consider the vehicle here confronting the source. I will be assuming the source is now just a head for the mental <coughs> operation, but it will then generalize. <clears throat> and so uh, we're saying we're, we're uh, characterizing the, um, the uh, physical um, the environment and the sensors by saying that as a function of heading for both of these sensors, the intensity will be um, uh, mono, uh, modal, maybe Gaussian or something. I, I, this is where I didn't, I'm not quantitative, just saying qualitatively, some monomodal distribution. So there's a, a, a maximum when you're heading right to the source. And um, and then falling off in some form when your heading turns away from that. And so what we'll be now <clears throat> thinking through is two things. We'll be thinking through what happens to the intensity each sensor then transmits to its motor. And we'll be thinking about the difference between those two. Um, and so the fundamental thing that I'm assuming is that the difference between those two, these two will be such that, um, that when, you know, whichever sensor is closer in orientation to the source gets more um, intensity. <clears throat> uh, and, and so uh, let's say in the ideal situation when they're both at the same orientation to the source, then we'll be here, we'll have zero. If we turn the vehicle a little bit to the left, then there will be more um, intensity, sorry, a little bit to the right, I think. There will be more intensity on the for the left sensor, which will be heading more directly to the source than on the right one. And then we're here in this regime where there is a positive difference. And um, then uh, by symmetry, it's, it's the opposite on the other side. There's a subtlety in all of these derivations. What I did here, and this is in the book, um, is I take heading to be um, such that when we have large heading, then we're turning to the right, which is not actually how this is mathematically defined. As you may know, the angles are typically defined to go counterclockwise. And that is always a bit confusing in these graphs that you're, the vehicle turns to the left, but you're moving to the right on these plots. And so for this book, for some of these um, um, illustrations, we're cheating. We're, we're using heading direction in the mathematically incorrect sense where we're counting the angle to be larger to the right. Um, in our, we have publications where we actually do this mathematically for robots, uh, where we do this correctly. And, and so sometimes can be confusing if you read those papers, everything is upside down. Sorry, that's just, uh, so we, we thought it was a good pedagogical device to avoid that confusion by defining heading direction in an unconventional way where larger angles mean you go to the right. Now, so that's where I made this initial mistake that if you turn a little bit to the right, there will be heading here uh, uh, to the right of the source. There will be more intensity on the left than on the right and you will have this and you know, vice versa. <clears throat> now, um, so, so if this is the difference that, uh, that you sent between these uh, two sensors, let's now see what happens to the, to the uh, turning of the, the wheels. And for that, I'll look at first at these individual um, portions here on the left and on the right. So here I have a connection 
you know, between a sensor with this negative characteristic and then a motor with this positive characteristic. And what you need to understand is that, uh, that from that, you can directly compute how the wheel motion depends on the intensity. As a mathematical operation, this would be the concatenation of the two functions. So first apply this function, and then you apply on the output of that function, this function here. And as a result, the inner variable, the activation goes away and you get directly this order function. Um, I found in past lectures, this to be surprisingly difficult for people who are not so trained in this sort of math to actually mentally do such concatenations. Um, one, one simple way to think of it is to take particular reference points. For instance, you take a high intensity value, you know, get a uh, low act uh, yeah, uh, low activation out of it, low activation, it's a low wheel. So high intensity and low wheel motion here. And then take another point, low intensity, high activation, high activation, high wheel motion. So low intensity goes to high wheel motion, you know, and then between it's linear. Uh, and another way to think about it, um, this is a, a positive slope, so it's like the identity function. And this is like a minus sign, you know, and plus times minus gives you minus. Uh, that's how you get. So the concatenation of this makes that intensity is translated into wheel motion with this negative slope. Now we can apply that to the two sides, right? So this side will have that negative um, characteristic, that side will have the same negative characteristic. So if I now just take the difference between these two sides, so I'm looking at difference in intensity left, right, difference intensity uh, of the wheel motion, I also get a linear function like that. I just made this again explicit mathematically. So if you were to model this linear function by having here the minus intensity dependence with some slope in front and the offset is you know, where it cuts here at zero intensity, and you have the same for the right. I'm assuming they're the exact same. So these offsets and slopes are the same. Then if you take the difference left minus right, you get the difference left minus right in intensity with a minus here in front. That's how you explain that it leads to a negative characteristic like that. So now you can directly concatenate the, um, uh, what we uh, j just looked at. We said that the difference uh, between intensity left right as a function of how you're oriented to the source, the heading direction here. Uh, now, you know, this, this, this here is again what we have as input there. It's another form of concatenation. Do I have another? Yeah, another, uh, it's just amplified the same plot. So, uh, so the, the output of this first function is the input to that second function. So you now again have to concatenate these two functions. So what happens when you take a function like that and concatenate it with a linear function? If it was a positive slope, it would be identity, would give you the same function. Negative slope, it just flips the function, right? That's what happens. So it just flips that function, it's like multiplying it with minus one. And that's what we were looking for, right? Now you have the turning rate of the vehicle as a function of its heading, having this shape. That's what I showed you earlier as uh, generating the subtractor. So that's, that's a theorem that I tried to prove. And so a couple of interesting things about that. So, um, so first of all, I redescribe what I just did. Um, so you have a forward nervous system. Forward meaning there is a unique input-output relationship, which is actually a trivial one, right? The input-output relation that that defines is this, uh, where is it here, is this function here, input, output for one side, right? And same for the other side. So it's a feed forward neural, neural network, the trivial, most trivial neural network you can think of. Um, it's embedded in the environment in closed loop. And what you get from that is a nonlinear dynamics. The nonlinear, you know, this here is, uh, it could, could be perhaps approximate as linear. It's nonlinear ultimately because it's a periodic function. Once you turn around, you get the same uh, as you were originally. So it can't be just a linear function. It would be like a sine function maybe the generalization of a, of a linear function to angular variables. And it has an attractor state, it has a, a stable solution. Uh, and we would call that a behavioral dynamics because the state here that predicts the future, remember the dynamical system is having 
uh, state variables where just giving the initial value, you can predict the future. The state variable is something physical. It's a behavioral thing, a me mechanical thing of how you move, or in this case, how you're oriented in the world. That determines well, how you will be moving in the future. Um, I'll make the connection to cybernetics in a moment. <clears throat> um, and, and then the other more subtle point that we'll see time and again when we talk about neurodynamics. So neurodynamics will be where the variable is just an activation, it's not physical. I mean, it's also physical, but not mechanical, let's say. Um, now the subtlety is that the attractor is actually only the one behavior when the vehicle is moving straight for the source. Once it has turned to the source and it will be going straight, maybe it will stop at some point, but it will be staying in that track. It's almost like if it has already stopped its posture and while it's still driving, it's driving straight on a straight line. It's a very simple case. That's the attractor, strictly speaking. But this attractor, this stable state, actually organizes the entire ensemble of behaviors. That is, for any initial condition, you would be ending up in that state. And so you can predict the future based on the attractor. The attractor organizes the ensemble of solutions. So Sophie, um, I'm not sure she already talked about that. She might do that today about um, sort of the flow, the qualitative dynamics that you can characterize the qualitative dynamics by attractors and also repellers and also instabilities and so on. It gets more complicated. This will be the case where there's just single energy attractor. Turns out there's a repeller in the back if you, if you uh, think of this as a periodic thing. I didn't want to get into that. And that will be a theme we'll have throughout. We'll always think about attractor states. But in practice, the system is not going to sit in an attractor state for very long. It's mostly really moving to an attractor state. Maybe then a new attractor state arises. In the neurodynamics, it will be often through change of simulation, for instance. And the system will be tracking that state. But the, you can say the attractor state sort of organizes the entire dynamical behavior and therefore it can be characterized or, 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 or the function is connected to that. You can say the function interpretation is based on understanding what the attractor states are. Okay, so that, that was the point here about this derivation. I wanted to uh, uh, refer to cybernetics. Cybernetics is just sort of glorified control theory. Some of you are uh, trained in engineering. I'm, I'm wondering how many. Uh, and we'll know it, uh, know a lot of these concepts um, under in the terminology of the control theory. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, Breitenberg actually was uh, part of what was called then biological cybernetics. Cybernetics was supposed to be more general. And in fact, the way we'll be talking about behavior dynamics is quite consistent with what cyberneticists had in mind. Um, I, I just I want to make this embedding to point to a, a, a point of departure, actually, where what we'll be looking at in the rest of the course will be, go beyond cybernetics. So when people uh, think about um, the systems like that from a cybernetic point of view, they, um, there's always the notion that there is something that is desired, that is the uh state you want to achieve for instance in control theory it would be like the reference trajectory you give the system some desired behavior that might be coming from a planner where you have a plan that leads to a desired trajectory and the control system is supposed to to impose or to make sure that the actual physical system does that thing that you desire so so makes the uh, time course for instance that you have planned physical physically real converges on that. Um, and so when one talks like that, then the, the notion is that what the sensors do or what you extract as a nervous system from the sensors is some information about error that is about the deviation from that desired state and that you arrange the whole system to be such that it reduces that error ultimately to zero. So for instance, in this case, you could think the desired behavior is a certain desired heading that would be where the the tractor lies, and you interpret this axis not as being heading in general, but as being error. So you would make the uh, uh, origin of the axis here would be just you know, subtracting the 
heading off the attractor and then you have an arrow axis. And then you could say, well, if I have a positive arrow, I'm going to make a negative change. So I would uh, you know, make this part of the controller. And if I have a negative arrow, I make a positive uh, change so that that error is reduced. If that was a linear function, it would be a so-called P controller, a proportional controller. And you could do that same with one derivative higher or not. That would be a differential or an integral component, a controller, but it would be one of those classical P, PD, typically use second order systems and call those PD controllers. So that would be just a rewriting of the variables and it would be, uh, you could say that is a valid uh, interpretation of this. <clears throat> so here I made this more explicit. Um, you know, I would now interpret the difference in intensity here as an error signal and then interpret the difference in speed you send to the two motors as the control signal. And then you actually really have a linear controller if these characters are linear that um, you know, has a negative, negative slope makes it stable. And that really ensures that you go to that attractor. Now, <clears throat> this, um, so that's a valid reading. Um, and it is critically based on the fact that uh, you have this club loose behavior that is that you can, you know, when you analyze this theoretically, that then you use the model of the world to predict what would be the sensory consequence of the robot turning. And that prediction is a mental simulation I'm making here. Um, is based on that that is here I would say you know when i'm uh, then uh, updating then the next time i will look up how much intensity difference there will be i will be here at a different uh, for instance smaller value and that is because i'm assuming that there's this model of the environment here this model of the environment that makes sure that that actually happens that when i change heading in this way i will get an intensity difference that lies on that curve you know closer to the origin Now, uh, the, you know, the uh, views that I will be talking about are, are not limited to this perspective. Um, Excuse and, me? Yes, yes. I would have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, I didn't understand quite why, why um, uh, high intensity leads to a low uh, activation. Is it because um, the sensors were just uh, programmed that way or why is it? Yes, so this will be just a... Um, Let's say if this is the case, then that behavior would emerge. That's the logic. Um, Breitenberg analyzes also systems where that's not the case. For instance, we have a, a positive slope here, um, and then different behavior emerges. For instance, that leads here to some kind of avoidance behavior. It would be turning away from sources. Yeah. So it was um, just an example for. It's just for an example. Okay. It actually happens so that there are sensors in the nervous system that are like that, and if you know that photoreceptors actually are like that. But you know that's not. They are not. We're not really doing phototaxis that way, right? So it's it's. So this is just an illustration. Okay. Thank you. That, that cleared it up. Yeah. Good. So I want to now uh, point out that um, there is a practical limitation in taking the cybernetic view, and then actually want to uh, argue that that is also something conceptual behind that. That's really important when we talk about cognition, um, which we will try be trying to get to in this course very quickly. Um, so uh, the, the, the cybernetic view uh, presupposes that there is a well-defined goal, the set point where you, know, where you set the zero, where the, relative to which the error is defined. That's what it's about. And it's not about determining that goal. It is about making sure the goal is achieved given that goal. Um, now here's a, a case where that is maybe less obvious. And so here I've, I have uh, two sources and I'm assuming the intensity is bimodal. And uh, if you go through the same mental logic using the same model, then you will arrive at a dynamic system that looks like this, where there will be at the local maximum, there will be an attractor at that local maximum will be another attractor. And just by the continuity of everything, you can see that the curve that has a negative slope going through this attractor has to sort of come around on the other side to make this 
part of the curve and somewhere in between it will have to go um, through a fixed point with a positive slope and as you learned from um, Sophie I, be I believe you already have that you, this is a repeller so this is a fixed point where that's unstable that is if you're a little bit to the right of that you will be in this range of positive rate of change so converging all the way to this attractor if you're a little bit to the left of that you will have a negative rate of change and then converge all the way to this attractor right so this is a we call this a bistable system because there are two attractors and which of these attractors you go to is decided by your initial heading if your initial heading is when you first encounter the source you have to think of course where you're coming from and so on um you know that initial heading would determine in which way uh, in which direction you go so in a way uh, this system would be making decisions that's already uh, a little bit cognitive, you would say. Uh, decision making is maybe the most elementary form of cognition. Here, the decision would be in the first approximation being made entirely, but just based on your physical state, your initial heading. So, let's say if you you approach the source from very far, the because the intensity falls off when you're far enough, you don't actually sense anything. So this is flat, and then as you approach it, you know these these um, peaks grow out of zero and as a result these uh, when when there are no there's no intensity if you go through this logic this would be a flat dynamics there's nothing and then slowly you know, this little, these attractors emerge and as that happens you might have some initial heading that comes just from wherever else you came earlier and if that heading lies somewhere to the left of that repeller direction then you would be attracted into this uh, decision and in the other case into that decision so it's not a decision that is mental or you know, that you make up in your mind it is something that is physically manifest you can, in fact you could read off the uh, physical state of the sensor uh, of the agent uh, to see that there's actually a physical example of that that was done in bilateral cybernetics I don't have those slides in here I could put those back in here um, this was actually someone called Tomasio Poggio whose name you will perhaps run into when you read more about uh, sort of neural theories of cognition. Uh, he was at the Max Planck Institute at the time uh, working with uh, Werner Reichert, who was the other founding director next to Valentino Breitenberg. And, and they studied taxes beha orientation behavior in flies. So flies tend to orient um, to certain stimuli. So, so one behavior that you can very reliably get in flies is that they orient to something that moves on their facet eye with a certain temporal characteristic, certain frequency. That would be, for instance, another fly. For instance, male flies will be tracking female flies you know, to ultimately copulate. And, and they, they do an amazing speed. And uh, these folks have actually figured out in detail the neural circuitry that, that does that. It's not exactly like that, but it, it has sort of that kind of characteristic that, that there is a neural signal coming on the facet eye from something moving. There's so-called motion detectors, and that's what they really studied, how the motion detection works. And the motion detector signal gives some activation that is a, fun is a function of... Um, or is you know is in different neural population depending on where on the facet eye it is, and that's coupled directly to the motors. The flies actually have these two wings, which are sort of like two wheels, and they um, pretty much work like that. That is, if one of the uh, wings um, is less activated, then uh, the uh, fly turns in that direction. Of course, they do it in three D, but in the experiments, actually, they do that in two D. They they glue the fly to a torque meter. And this way they can see in which direction that it fly wants to turn. And they even did things like virtual reality for flies. That is, they measured the torque and then animated a visual array around the torque, like a cylinder on which some, some stimuli were brought. And they rotated that uh, consistent with the fly's torque generation so that they could simulate closed loop flying and could sort of see what the fly does. And, and so uh, one interesting experiment that Poggio did was to bring in um, two, two moving things. These weren't actually other flies, they were just uh, on that drum. They had little, little markers, uh, you know, little uh, 
not even sure if they were actually moving or it was just the movement of the, the drum that made them move. And then they observed that the flies would be tracking one of those and then occasionally they would be switching to the other one uh, if you know because tracking isn't perfect and then through some noise they would be switching from one attractor to the other one so this is a pretty good mathematical description of this kind of behaviors in flight which you know is of course again a little bit more complex than just picking up the intensity of something so uh, so that's an interesting story uh, because of you know the emergence of things like decision and they have to do with nonlinearity. So this dynamics here is nonlinear just in the sense that it's not a straight line, but you know qualitatively it's sort of linear. If you approximate this by a straight line, there's nothing qualitatively different about that. This you couldn't because the straight line, of course, will always intersect only once, so you cannot get a straight line to intersect three times. So it's really important in an important way, non-linear. There's a typo here, non-linear. And um, so that's an important message that you get these uh, sort of more, you know, more cognitive looking things from non-linear dynamics. Um, but cycling back to cybernetics, actually, I wonder if I have that. No, uh, uh, circling back to cybernetics, um, in this case, you could no longer really say that heading direction is an error variable because you know error variable would have to be relative to one of those targets. You see, this is a little bit more general. Uh, or you could say the subjective view is like a specialized view that you separate out the decision making. You have to somehow done that, and then you're looking at how that decision is imposed, or controlled. But uh, you see from this picture, which one could still call cybernetic, but it's not control theoretic in the sense that here the fixed point emerges from the behavior and the mechanism that stabilizes the behavior, that realizes the behavior, is also the mechanism through which the selection arises. So that's an important point. And that is a much more reasonable picture of that will generalize for neural uh, dynamics because we'll not really think that the neural dynamics is just about steering, controlling the brain to go to some preset state that you have selected. No, we'll argue that it's the dynamics of the brain that lead you to certain attractor states that are then the states you know, that make your thinking, make your decisions, your memory, and things like that, your plans. And they emerge as stable states. And so there's no need to have someone else sort of compute what the desired state is. The whole notion of desired state is just an interpretation, but it will really emerge from the dynamics. Even in a more technical sense, there is some subtlety here that I want to point out. So if you push these sources closer to each other and the intensity distributions, you have this sort of spatial shape, you could see that if you superpose the distributions of the two source, at some point they will merge into a monomodal distribution where the maximum intensity is sensed out in the middle, you know, because the two intensities add up. You could see you know, if you pu push these two curves together, that will happen. And if you think through the logic, it would lead to a neural, uh, to a uh, turning rate dynamics that will, you know, again, have a fixed point at the local minimum maximum here. So. Maybe this was actually computed from something, so it has a little bit different slope here, but it's a single attractor in the middle. This would be averaging, averaging behavior. You, you uh, move toward the average direction between the two sources. Such things can actually be observed, for instance, saccadic eye movements. People um, make an aesthetic eye movement that averages between different um, elements of contrast. You do that in reading all the time. If you read a word, there are a lot of letters in there. You can direct your gaze at individual letters when they're far enough from each other, but when they're in a word, you average the contrast elements to fixate somewhere in the word. We don't actually average exactly in the middle. It also depends on the direction of reading. Like uh, folks like us um, fixate a little bit further into the word and no, it's actually uh, more at the front. I forgot which direction it goes. Huh more at the front of the word or more into the word and remember but for instance hebrew readers uh, fix it in the mirror symmetric way so you can always see it depends on reading direction um so so averaging is, is a known um, phenomenon and so the 
you could say when you do averaging, you don't make decisions, right? Then you you have this more cybernetic. You just have some averaging, some some average behavior. So the difference between those two is a bifurcation. And you'll get that today, I believe, in the tutorial. You will is a parameter which would be the distance between the sources that leads to different attractor landscapes. So a single attractor for small small distance, this averaging case, and two attractors with a repeller in the middle for large distances, this is actually the pitchfork bifurcation in which I believe uh, Sophie will go through mathematically today. If she didn't do it last day, last week, but I think she it's today. Okay, so I already pointed out that the, um, you know, this nature, the, the, the nature of the uh, perceptual variables is different, it's not error signals. Um, and therefore we, we really don't, cannot say that dynamics is control theory, but it's similar in spirit because it emphasizes the closed loop nature of, uh, of things. Now, a last point I will be making that will take, uh, so take a, a little, maybe 20 minutes, is that the loop doesn't always need to be closed through the environment. It can be also closed internally. And I'll just make this very briefly here. Um, it actually takes less than 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so one way to think about that is to say the decision-making that we did so far was overt in the sense that your body shows the decision. Now, I said, you know, it is actually through your body that you make the decision, but you could also say, if you want to make a decision, you're acting it out. So the, the, it's the physical state that stores the state of the decision, stores in the sense that, you know, every moment in time, you're just using this, uh, you know, the, the agent just generates this turning rate and it's because your body is at a particular location along this axis that you will then consistently be exposed here to this attractor influence. Uh, in that sense, it's the, the state is this bodily state. Um, you could ask, you know, what about a mental decision? So, so when you just uh, think about it. So for instance, you could say, I, uh, as an uh, agent, I'm in front of these two sources, and now I want to um, make the decision that I will move to the left source, but I'm not acting it out. I'm, I'm controlling separately my speed, my forward speed, and stay put until maybe somebody gives me a, a go signal. And when I then go, there's nothing in the environment that uh, marks that you selected that initial goal. You, maybe you would be able, for instance, to uh, select the leftmost source, even if it wasn't the closer one or the stronger one. <clears throat> maybe you had it even oriented to the other source, but you selected the left one. And you want to remember that it's store, you know, remember as a state variable that that's the source they're heading for. Maybe in the extreme case, you could even have the, uh, uh, yeah, actually, I have that here somewhere you could even turn off the sources and still maybe want to remember which decision you made we'll come to that mm -hmm. so that would be um, more than just making decisions by behavior that would be making decisions by something inside of you so you would need a more complex nervous system already hinting at that uh, you know the nervous system we had so far is uniquely uh, determined by the sensory information. So you have a certain sensory information which reflects a certain bodily configuration in the world. Um, the motor response is unique. That's why the system can't really store multiple different decisions. You would have to have some recurrency, perhaps some loops where there is some coupling between different neurons so that activation kept in this nervous system could make the difference. <clears throat> So one simple way of thinking about that is to say, well, I will have a neuron, for instance, for each sensor or for each turning direction or something like that. And um, each neuron is a dynamical variable. That will be the kind of neurodynamics we'll be discussing from next week on. So think of this neuron ha as having an activation uh, level uh, and a, a rate of change. So that will be a dynamical system of activation. We we'll call that in neurodynamics. We will argue that it has that kind of shape that is will have a negative kind of slope. 
but it could be bistable. That's that's what uh, I'll, I'll derive how that works in the next lecture. Uh, and if it's bistable, then it could make a decision that in the sense it could decide to be here at positive levels of activation where the green dot here indicates that that's what happened to this neuron. And it could alternatively be at the uh, negative activation level, which will be say that it is off. It didn't, <clears throat> it doesn't really activate anything. Uh, that will be the other decision. And maybe you have a second neuron for the other source and that would uh, be in the off uh, state, let's say, and, and not in the off state. And so when we had would have these two neurons in this configuration, it will be a stable state because both neurons are in an attractor. So it could store that information by that activation pattern inside the nervous system. And uh, that would be the decision to go for source one because that would be activated and source two would be deactivated. That kind of decision making could come about if these two neurons are coupled in a way that they cannot both be on at the same time. <clears throat> so when this one is on, for instance, it would have a inhibitory influence on this one. And that will be in some way that I don't plot here, suppress somehow this attractor. So it only has this attractor left and vice versa. This such competitive or selective coupling is through inhibition. They inhibit each other. Inhibition means you shift the attractors toward the left, toward negative values. <clears throat> And we'll look at concrete dynamic systems that are like that in the next lecture. And so with that sort of system, you could represent through this activation pattern your decision. So for instance, this activation pattern where one neuron is positive, the other is negative, would be this mental decision to move to source one, whatever that neuron stands for, right? For source one and <clears throat> it, uh, the other one, uh, you know, not toward the source two. That's good how that could be done. Now you, you see there's a little gap in here because I'm just saying, well, there is a neuron that stands for that source, another neuron that stands for the other source. That's kind of demanding, right? That would mean that you somehow have a perceptual system that knows about sources, and then you can represent the source by assigning a neuron to the source, another source <clears throat> as another neuron, and they compete. Could see a, that's a far cry from this very simple uh, Breitenberg vehicle that uh, just transduces sensor information into motor activation. So is that really what we need? Breitenberg in his book constructs uh, vehicles that approach things like that. And he's actually very aware or was very aware of these difficulties, for instance, of making <clears throat> detections of things in the world and uh, selections and uh, segmentation that, you know, <clears throat> how to tell that things are different and certainly doesn't work the simple way. Uh, we will be using in the lecture a picture that makes that simpler to understand. That will be the notion of neural activation fields. <clears throat> so you can imagine that you had some way of transducing sensor information. Maybe you need more than two sensors for that, maybe a whole bunch of sensors that would feed neurons that represent some continuous dimension. This would be, for instance, heading direction. So you could say for every direction from the vehicle, I have some sensor input by combining the values of, let's say, these two sensors or more than two, there will be the red light. And maybe under some conditions, you know, you would have a little bit more input here in these regions than in those regions. And now you could think of having a whole population of neurons that are tuned to that heading direction, minimally also just a handful of those, maybe or two or, three or four, <clears throat> but it could be sampled more densely. And, um, and then you could say activation patterns in this population, this will be a neural map in, in the jargon that you might, might be familiar with from cortical maps or subcortical maps, map <clears throat> meaning that different neurons uh, stand for different values out in the sensory world. So when I plot the activation as a function of this dimension, maybe heading direction, then it would be a, a map of heading direction at each neuron standing. When I plot the activation of the neuron here in a particular location, I'm, I mean that this neuron stands for that direction, stands for in the sense it receives input whenever a source is at that direction. So in a, in a picture like that, the kind of uh, mental picture we'll make is to say that will be 
um, dynamics of such activation variables that are such that it selects one of those two localized, uh, those uh, monomodal peaks here. So for instance, it could generate a peak that's centered over one source of input and the peak that's centered over the other source is suppressed. You see it's here below zero suppressed. That will be by inhibition, inhibitory coupling. It suppresses that peak so that only this peak survives. It would still be, it wouldn't be a symbol, you know, not like before I said so, source one, yearn one, source two, yearn two. So that problem of having a symbolic representation, which you could number and you could continue to say this is always source one and that was always those two and you don't have to reassign a label every step in time zone. All of this would be automatic because you don't have to label it. It will be just defined by where it is in the heading space. And you could track it. For instance, you could, as you move around the exact orientation which the source uh, is visible might change. So that's why I'm saying the recent input could maybe be close to this. And that's maybe why you selected this node because the peak from that recent inview, input, the peak of activation was close to the current location of input and that biased the system to stay with the same peak and not switch to another input uh, that is a further distance away. That's actually the concrete, the picture we'll be using in the rest of the course to understand how selection decisions and more things like detection decisions, memory decisions and so on are made. And that would be purely mental because it would take place in the nervous system. It wouldn't require necessarily that the loop is closed. That is that the peak drives motor behavior and that leads to a particular um, change of sensory information. It turns out that when you actually do this neurally that you have internal loops that are closed. So the field will talk to itself uh, provide input to itself in a looped form. And that makes this a bit of the peaks and we'll get to that next week. And so um, the, the other way that this could work uh, is um, what, what I hinted at that I, I might want to have that peak and stabilize the peak even after the sources were removed. I, I forgot to make the you know, maybe I should now cut out these sources. <laughs> these two red uh, crosses should be over these sources. And I can create conditions under which uh, activation will persist even as that uh, these sources are removed. And that will be a form of working memory. That is now you would say, I'm gonna move in this direction and not because you have any direct sensory information about that direction, but because you made the decision why you had that sensory information. And then you just keep it in mind and keep it in mind in a sense here of sustaining that activation through a mechanism I have to explain. Um, and, and then there's an inner state that now um, can be measured in behavior. So ultimately the inner state can be observed through behavior because once we allow that system to actually move, then we'll see from the movement behavior what its memory was, where the state was. And that is the procedure of how we are, of course, really observing uh, humans or animals um, in our state by asking them to act on it. So for instance, the evidence for sustained activation comes from monkeys that are given a cue after, you know, they've learned the task, a cue as to which button to press or which direction to move a joystick, but they're instructed to not do that immediately, to wait for a certain waiting period. And during that waiting period and after that waiting period, the stimulus that tells them exactly what to do has been removed. So the only way they can now uh, make the right movement is by keeping in mind what their earlier decision was. And um, you find that then neurons in certain areas, especially in frontal cortex, uh, do keep firing during that interval in a way that by coding and decoding can be associated with the decision they made. So there's quite literally work, uh, you know, neural mechanism like that. Of course, it's not a vehicle turning, it's this much more complex nervous system that makes uh, funds directed. Actually, in many cases, it's just some saccadic eye movement as indicating the decision. So that, that's fairly simple. Sometimes it's button pressing or it's the monkey moving the hand in a certain direction or selecting a certain stimulus for, for, for handling. Okay, so that's what we will be looking at in the rest of the course. We will be harking back to behavioral dynamics in one lecture, I think maybe toward the end of uh, this year, like before Christmas, I'm not sure exactly how far we'll get, um, where we'll ask how neurodynamics is coupled to behavioral dynamics. It will turn out to be 
pretty much suggested here that something like that would directly drive the, the behavior. There's going to be some subtleties about that. But uh, in most of the course, we'll really talk about neural dynamics, where the activation variables are the state. Good. With this, I close the lecture and am available for questions.